If you spent any time reading EV comment sections, you've definitely seen people say, even in my videos, uh, that sodium ion batteries just are not good enough for cars. You'll see things like, really good for off-grid storage, not very good for cars, not enough energy density, the voltage range is way too wide, and it's basically fine for stationary batteries, not good for cars. For a long time, that wasn't a ridiculous thing to say, I would imagine. Early sodium ion chemistries, you know, that really was behind lithium-based batteries in some important areas. But what has changed recently, and I literally mean in the last three or four years, is that CATL, the world's largest battery manufacturer, has launched its next generation sodium ion battery platform, often referred to as Naxtra, and they're positioning it for real vehicles, not lab demos, not future concepts, and that forces us to re-examine a few assumptions that people keep repeating as if they're still true. It's just not. So in this video, I wanna go through the most common reasons people say sodium batteries are not suitable for cars and explain why those arguments don't really hold up anymore. And also go over a couple of other things about this new chemistry. Hello folks, my name is Ben Alexander. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really chuffed, so many people are watching my videos lately. All the new subscribers, channel members as well. If you, if you give me a couple of dollars on YouTube, Patreon, or you've bought me a coffee, Thank you very much. I really touched by that. Genuinely, you'll probably never know how much. I'm just really touched by that. It's really lovely. So thank you very much. One of the first objections people raise sounds very technical, which is why it tends to shut conversations down quickly because people can't really be bothered to go into details in the comments, I guess. Some people have some really great things to say, though, and that's the, the voltage curve argument. I would probably imagine three or four uh, out of five of you probably don't really know about it, but it is a big deal. The voltage range is is pretty crazy, it's pretty wild on sodium ion chemistry batteries. And it, I would say you could use the word worse. It has a worse voltage curve. And because of that, it's less efficient to convert the energy into, uh, you know, the battery uh, voltage into a stable usable voltage for an EV drivetrain. So what they're usually referring to is the fact that sodium ion battery cells operate at a different nominal voltage compared to a common lithium chemistry like LFP. These days, basically, it's all, it's mostly LFP. Some people use NMC or something like that, but sodium has a different electrochemical potential, so individual cells can sit at a lower voltage and the discharge curve can look very, very different on a graph. Now, there is a kernel of truth in that. If you're designing an EV platform around a very specific uh, voltage window, sodium ion may require a different pack configuration or more cells in series and some re-optimization of power electronics. That's very real, that's not rubbish, that is genuinely a thing. But that's a design challenge, not a fundamental barrier. They're two very different things. EVs already deal with variable uh, pack voltage all the time. Battery packs don't output a single fixed voltage. Voltage sifts with state of charge or temperature and load. And modern inverters and ele the electronics around batteries are designed basically to handle that and they can work perfectly with cars. There is literally no difference at all. So the manufacturers care about operating within a sort of a, a range, you know, like a window or a, a certain parameters, not hitting a specific number that is unattainable by sodium ion or LFP chemistry, something like that. So the more accurate version of this argument is not sodium ion can't work in cars, but sodium ion may require different design choices and slightly different electronics and a different engineering. And the fact that CATL is putting this chemistry into mass production, or it has actually, as of I think November it was, for vehicles tells you that they have already solved that problem to a commercially acceptable level. The second big objection is energy density, which usually gets simplified, oversimplified, to the range. Uh, the range will be basically just worse and not good enough. Historically, sodium ion, you know, absolutely did lag. Uh, with regards to when you reconcile to LFP chemistry and sodium ion, but that's not the case anymore. They did have lower watt-hours per kilogram, just not anymore, which made them unattractive for long-range EVs. But the myth that people keep repeating is that lower energy density automatically means not suitable for cars. That's not actually how vehicles work in the real world, and it's not how commercialization uh, works either. It just means that the chemistry isn't optimal and maybe not as good as some others in a specific regard. 
and uh, of, or for every type of vehicle, not for uh, you know vehicles that need 800 kilometer range or something like that, or a thousand kilometers of range, but city cars, second cars, uh, fleet vehicles, taxis or delivery vans, things like that, the Royal Mail in the UK, and a lot of commuter vehicles, they, they, they don't benefit too much from ultra high energy density, and that's why we can use them in those uh, situations. What they benefit from is predictable behavior, durability, cost stability, and safety margins. Th these are the big selling points. It's basically all the issues that were uh, slightly problematic for ordinary batteries like LFP chemistry, NCM. They've just deleted them all, most of those issues. CATL's latest sodium ion cells are now reaching energy density uh, figures that put them basically just slightly above LFP chemistry that you can get from BYD now, so slightly more energy dense than a BYD Atto 3 or a Dolphin or something like that. So that doesn't mean sodium ion replaces all lithium everywhere because of that, although I do think it's going to be the biggest shift. I think it's going to be an even bigger shift than when LFP became very, very common in the last six or seven years. It means it's now good enough for a large number of use cases that actually matter in mass markets like house batteries, which are going up like crazy, uh, EV sales, which are going exponentially higher every year. The third objection, and this one really does matter if you live anywhere, that is cold. Norway, Sweden, Finland, the UK gets very, very cold, is low temperature performance. You'll sometimes see people say sodium ion is only slightly better than LFP in the cold, or that the difference is marginal and not overly great. That's very misleading. That is really just not true at all. Nothing suggests that in the data. One of sodium ion's genuine strengths is cold weather behavior. Sodium ion chemistry tends to have lower internal resistance at low temperatures, which is uh, bet it has better charge acceptance basically in the cold, which means it almost doesn't really affect it very much at all, being minus 20 Celsius or something like that, and more stable performance during winter operation. That means less range loss on cold mornings in cold climates, for example, more predictable charging, and fewer of the frustrating winter quirks that have basically put people off of EVs in colder climates for the last 10 years. So this is not a theoretical advantage, it's definitely a real advantage and it's something that Norwegians will feel, Swedish people will feel, people from the UK will feel. CATL has been talking about low temperature performance as a core benefit of sodium ion for a few years now actually and it's uh, one of the reasons that the chemistry keeps coming back into serious automotive discussions for people in Northern Europe, as I've just said, inland Australia or uh, not like r really inland but sort of like on the granite belt or something like that. It's cold, you know, so anywhere with uh, harsh winters, this is not going to be a minor detail. This is That will directly affect your daily usability. Another common argument is that lithium is more proven and safer, and it's true that lithium iron has a massive head start. It's been refined over you know, a few decades now, actually, deployed at enormous scale, particularly since 2019, and its failure modes are... Uh, well understood. That history makes a very big difference, but what often gets overlooked is that sodium ion has some intrinsic safety advantages and has, on, has only really been uh, heavily worked on in the last three years by CATL, and they've already basically just gotten very, very slightly better than B BYD's uh, energy density uh, in the last three years. So it's generally more chemically stable, less prone to the more most aggressive forms of thermal runaway, and easier to manage in fire scenarios. You can actually pretty much put it out. That doesn't mean sodium ion is magically immune to failure. No batteries, uh, you know, battery chemistry is. But safety is a genuine reason industry players continue investing in it and will want to purchase it, put it in their products to sell to us. So if sodium iron were inherently unsafe, CATL wouldn't be pushing it anywhere near passenger vehicles, that's for sure. So that's just not how they operate. And finally, there's the argument that sodium iron is only suitable for grid storage, stationary storage, not cars. This one sounds uh, logical on surface until you dig deeper because grid storage doesn't really care about weight or anything like that. But a lot of vehicles don't really care about weight in the same way performance cars do or uh, cars like the ones we, we do our daily commutes in because they need to be very efficient. A delivery van 
doing predictable routes in a city uh, or a, a city EV basically that rarely sees a motorway or a taxi fleet like uh, British Gas in the UK or internet installers and that sort of thing in and around cities and towns in the UK or Europe. Uh, they could do all right and a taxi fleet prioritizing cycle life and reliability or a commuter car that just needs to work properly every winter morning basically. These, these are very good for most people because as we know people seemingly only do 50 or 60 kilometers a day uh, on average roughly something like that. That depends where you are of course. So these are all automotive use cases where sodium iron can make sense. I mean really legitimately can make sense. So the real divide isn't grid storage versus cars. It's high performance, long range optimization versus cost optimized, uh, durability focused mobility. If, if we were to re be very reductive about it, I mean. So sodium iron fits very, very neatly into that second category. And, and that's really the core myth this video is about. Sodium iron isn't bad for cars. It's, it's bad for the wrong kind of car, I would imagine. The idea that every EV battery must be optimized for maximum energy density is outdated. As EVs move into the mass market and even they're, they're getting incredibly cheap now, priorities change. Affordability, uh, stability, safety is increasingly getting pushed up to that top of that list there and real world usability uh, start to matter more than headline numbers or range or a lot of other things. So that is why CATL backing sodium iron through something like the Naxtra platform really, really does matter. They're uh, not chasing hype, they're not chasing specs, they're responding to real demand and the manufacturers who want different trade-offs for different vehicles in different contexts. So I'm really curious to know, what do you think about it? Do you see sodium iron becoming common in small cars and fleets? Or do you think we'll see it in the next five years in long range EVs or anything like that? Do you think lithium keeps uh, will keep dominating basically everything for the next uh, few years outside of grid storage? And how much range as a minimum would you require if you were to buy a car? What's the number? If you want to put in the comments, just what is that number? The minimum kilometers that you'd need from a car or miles for you to purchase it, no matter what the price is of the car or what category of car it is or vehicle. Let me know in the comments. Thank you very much to the channel members who are again on the screen now. Thank you so much for uh, supporting the channel and have a lovely afternoon.